So uh, we've got uh, a, a really great session for you tonight. Music licensing, uh, making money from film, TV, and YouTube. And I am joined, I'm Dave Kusek from uh, Director of New Artist Model. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much. And I'm joined by Kevin Bruner, Vice President of Marketing of CD Baby. Hi, Kevin. Hello. How you doing? Great. Thanks so much uh, for spending your time tonight, Kevin. Uh, you've got a lot to uh, to talk about, I know. And, and most people, you know, know CD Baby from the great service of distribution that you guys started out with. But there's so much more going on, and mm -hmm. I'm excited to you know be able to hear about what you guys are up to and all the new opportunities that you're providing for people to. You know, ex explore a career in music. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Tonight we're going to talk about music licensing. Uh, this workshop, this webinar is, is brought to you by New Artist Model. New Artist Model is a complete online music business program. Uh, it's a self-paced program, and it, it covers the entire music business spectrum. There's over 100 learning modules, uh, many of which, like what you're seeing right now and what you're going to see tonight. Uh, it also includes a career map and budgeting tools for you to figure out what your specific plan is and, and what your direction is in your career. It's customized to what you want to do. Uh, we also have a private Facebook group that you join when you, uh, when you sign up for the new artist model. We have lots of exclusive content uh, in the program. The, the eight main modules are finding your fit and setting goals, uh, building a team around you because you can't do it yourself. Uh, even though this is a do-it-yourself music licensing uh, presentation, it's really all about a team. Uh, we talk about booking gigs and touring. We talk about recording, production, and distribution. We talk a lot about copyright. And that's the subject of tonight, along with licensing and publishing and all the different ways and opportunities that uh, you have to license your, your music. We talk about marketing and promotion, uh, marketing on social media, marketing in the real world, and also budgeting and crowdfunding. A part of the program is a complete musician's business plan that you get, where you, you basically fill out over a period of weeks uh, a form that we provide where you create and you craft your plan of where you're going in your career. And everyone's career is a little bit different. Uh, and we've tried to create a tool that allows you to, to pursue your dream and the, and the way that you want to go in your career. So we're going to start out with uh, sync licensing. That's really the subject of tonight's workshop. A sync license grants someone the right to synchronize your music with some kind of visual medium. And there are lots of different ways of doing that. We're going to get into that uh, in more detail tonight. But that's basically the definition of what a sync license is all about. Now, what are the rights involved in a sync license? There's actually two kinds of copyright involved. One is the composition or the song itself. And one is the sound recording. And Permission has to be granted from the owner of both of the copyrights in order to do a legal sync. Uh, the other important point here is that there really is no standard fee for sync licenses. Uh, everything is negotiated. So people have to technically get permission from both copyright holders in order to legally use music for visual format. Now, we have a huge advantage as indie artists in that many, many times we control both the composition and the song recording copyright. If you wrote and recorded the song, you have a huge advantage because you can negotiate a deal much quickly, more quickly and, and more easily because you own the copyrights, the, the two copyrights involved. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have labels or publishers involved. And it's a huge advantage for, for indie artists. Uh, 
And you can use a service like CD Baby, and we're going to learn a lot more about that tonight to help you in this, uh, in this endeavor. Now, real quick, uh, we've got a lot of questions from you folks uh, on the webinar sign-up. And I'm trying to answer some of those up front, and then we'll get into some more of those later. Uh, what kind of music uh, is best to use? And, you know, there are some generalizations here, so keep that, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But about half the music licensed for film and TV uh, in the U.S. is rock and pop. Uh, more than half the music licensed. Other than that, it tends to be genre-specific. And... Contrary, uh, you know, to what you would really want to see happen, generally it's just a minute or two or three of music that is licensed, not typically a whole song. Uh, music supervisors are the people that really are the gatekeepers to this, to this world, and, you know, they're looking for particular pieces of mu music to match certain scenes of a film or a commercial or production that they're creating and you you really just want to be uh, the right person in the right place at the right time with that piece of music that they're looking for. Generally they want sparse arrangements. They don't want lots of stuff going on. Uh, vague lyrics tend to be licensed uh, more readily than specific lyrics because again you're trying to match a scene in a a movie or a film or some other sort of production. Uh, lots of times you're you're trying to use music in a scene that contains dialogue, so that's another reason to kind of have sparse arrangements, vague lyrics. Uh, oftentimes sound-alikes or covers are licensed, and uh, I know Kevin will talk some more about that and, and his take on the kind of music that gets licensed, but these are just some generalizations that we've seen uh, in the marketplace and, and what's been licensed so far. To get ready to license your music, you want to have multiple versions of your songs. Uh, the, you know, the full work that you've created for your own reason, uh, of course, wants to be there, but oftentimes you want to create a, a more sparse arrangement of that work. And you also want to separate the vocals out if you can and provide that in a stereo mix with effects so that when folks are trying to match music to a scene that they have control over the vocals, how loud they are, and whether the vocals are present or not. Uh, you want to prepare to describe your work in great detail. That's how people uh, are searching for music. They're trying to find music with a certain feeling or a certain tempo or a certain vibe to it. Uh, so the more you can describe your songs, the better. You want to make your songs easy to find. And one way of doing that is to use a service like MusicSupervisor.com. This is a search engine that uh, quite a few music supervisors use to find cues to use in their Productions over a thousand music supervisors use it, and there are other tools that you can use. But that is that is one way where you can upload your stuff and get it ready to go. You also want to negotiate your rate. Uh, as I said earlier, sync is a big negotiation. There are no set rates. Uh, try not to license your music for free, and oftentimes you could consider a step deal where. You know, initially it, it perhaps is uh, no fee up front, but if the production does a certain uh, dollar volume or certain things happen, depending on what kind of production it is, you start to get paid more and more as the thing becomes successful. So again, some rules of thumb there are how to get ready, and I know Kevin will have his own take on that. Finally, you don't need a publisher in order to get a sync deal. Uh, Publishers will sometimes plug your music for you, but there are so many options now in how this all works that you don't necessarily need a publisher. So I'm going to turn things over right now to Kevin and have him talk about what's happening in the sync world and in the CD Baby world as well. Kevin, take it away. All right. Well, glad to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming everyone can hear me all right. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin Bruner. I've been working at CD Baby here going on 10 years, uh, and I've done a number of things. Currently, my title is VP of Marketing, but for a time, I was actually pitching tracks for film and TV and video games and all sorts of uh, good productions like that. Um, I'm also, you know, an artist myself. I've had uh, tracks from my band's projects, different bands that I've been in, used by MTV, the NFL, ABC used one of our songs this past fall, and uh, so still very active with with uh, music myself. And sync licensing is one of the things that I've I've loved for a long time. For for the artist, independent artist community is just such a great way to tap into more fans, to make money, and to uh, you know, to uh, to do music in a way that doesn't necessarily keep you on the road all the time. So, um, you know, D Dave covered sync licensing uh, in pretty good detail there. Dave, you did a good job covering all the little aspects yeah. of it. Um, and and so yeah, there's 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 I think the one thing that kind of where I start with artists about sync licensing and as an independent artist is you have to think differently about what what the point of sync licensing is and what, what the purpose, the music, is serving there. So, uh, you know, it's typical for an artist um, to, you know, when they're making their music to think about how they're going to distribute it, how they're going to, fans are going to buy it or stream it or how they're going to play it live. But really a lot of times what gets left is like, what are other ways that people may want to use this? Like, you know, Dave mentioned that, hey, you, it'd be good to have a, a, a version of the song that doesn't have vocals in it because, uh, you know, Good majority of the time that people play something in film or TV, they're going to want a version without the vocals. They may even jump back and forth between the vocals and non-vocal version. But just trying to reorient yourself around what what is useful in the world of film and TV and and other media options out there for my music and what what purpose can it serve and 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 you know that's really with sync licensing where it it starts. You know when when a music supervisor engages a company like us or another company that has a catalog of music, it, the conversation always starts with, I have this need. And the need is something related to what their music, or what their film production or their TV show or their ad campaign or their video game, what, what, what their musical need is for that project. And and that's that's a very key piece of information to know when you're when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to pursue a sync placement because if if your music doesn't fit the right need then there's no point in harassing that music supervisor to check out your music they're they're very busy people production schedules are intense and they're they're trying to churn through a lot of music that and find the, only the things that really suit their needs so you kind of have to identify. What your music, what need your music fills. Um, when uh, when I was doing actively pitching uh, here for CD Baby, I got requests for um, female vocal stuff all the time, like pop female vocal stuff. Well, you know my bands are hard rock or, or alternative rock bands with a male vocal, so it would be silly for me to even pitch my band to them because that's not what they're looking for and they would just get frustrated with me and 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 uh, um, not not be interested in, in in what I have to offer them so that that's kind of the first step as an artist when you're thinking about the world of sync licensing and is understanding the needs out there in the marketplace understanding what kind of music each show is using and and where you might fit in because if you don't fit it's not worth pitching to them because they're just going to get frustrated with you, and you want to be you want to be their friend, the person that comes up with that track that makes is exactly what they're looking for at the perfect time, and in order to get that placement, as opposed to be the irritant that's constantly pitching what they don't need. So that that's really kind of how you have to start looking at your music in the world of sync licensing, and um, you'll have more success when you can really be honest with yourself and pitch in uh, and and present yourself in that manner. Um, you know, I think the one thing that I love about uh, traditional sync licensing, we're going to talk about some micro sync options and YouTube and stuff in a in a little bit further on in the in the webinar. And I just knocked my water over, and that was that crashing noise. Um, but uh, the the one thing that I love about it is that uh, some of the tracks that I've placed here at CD Baby, 
are things that have been obscure, you know, just tracks that hadn't had much commercial success as far as building fans and selling, but they were the perfect thing for what the production was looking for. And that's where I love the world of sync licensing because it's it doesn't celebrity doesn't matter, record sales don't matter. It's all about um, does your music fit what I'm looking for to make this scene? And so it's been a, a real joy to work with a lot of artists who um, this is kind of a stepping stone even to, to make money for the first time from their music uh, because their music was useful in a way that they hadn't imagined. So that, that's why I like sync licensing. That's kind of how you know I think artists should start looking at their music, how it's useful, where it could be plugged in watching TV shows, movies, see who's using what, and really start listening to what's happening on TV. And that's just a good starting point to orient yourself, better orient yourself to the, the world of sync licensing and, and what type of music is being used where. So, uh, Kevin, one of the questions that we've gotten quite a few uh, people asking is, you know, how do you seek out sync opportunities? I mean, how do you connect with the music supervisors or the production companies that are creating, uh, you know, the more traditional film and TV and, and uh, indie movies. How do you suggest people approach that? You know, your best option right out of the gate is to, you know, make sure you're in a couple catalogs. You know, we have a sync licensing program here at CD Baby. We've uh, been getting more and more traditional sync placements. And uh, so first, get your music in, in our catalog. Then, you know, there's other boutique-type uh, music catalogs that uh, music licensing companies is what they usually call themselves that, that work in different ways, and they all have different, uh, different strengths. Um, there's one here in town that their strength is, you know, advertising agencies and, and doing some partnerships with brands. There's... And I'm in Portland, by the way, Portland, Oregon. There's some in LA. Most of the LA ones are really good at film and TV. And there's even some subsets of that where there's some licensing companies that are good with trailer companies that make trailer uh, movie trailers. And there's others that are good with feature films. And so you you kind of just need to do some digging around online and find some of these companies. Get your music accepted in some of those catalogs. Some of them are going to be exclusive that you're only going to be able to work with one. Usually those pay more, but there's there's some good ones that are non-exclusive, so you can get your music a couple places. And I would say, you know, start there. Then, you know, there's there's websites like IMDb where you can start seeing who's the music supervisor on various uh, projects. Uh, and then, you know, there's the, you can connect with folks on Twitter and Facebook. I would say before you start trying to reach out to any sort of music supervisor directly uh, on Twitter or Facebook. I've heard this over and over again from music supervisors. They absolutely hate it when artists approach them and have never heard the music that they place in their show. So if I'm working on a TV show and you're, like I said, if you're hammering them with music that's not what they use, uh, they get frustrated, but they really don't like it if you haven't taken the time to go watch a few episodes of the show. Um, so if you do you know, have a chance to engage with a music supervisor directly, it's perfect for you to say, Hey, I've been watching, you know, The Walking Dead or whatever show that you're the music supervisor of. I love the music you place there. My band writes similar music. Will you take a listen? I think it'd be good for the show. They're going to be very open to the idea of actually clicking on a link that you sent or downloading an MP3 or even, you know, some of them still actually do prefer CDs. Uh, so that's how you start making those relationships. It always helps if you can approach them and say, hey, my music's been placed in these places before. It's perfect for this TV show. I've been watching the show. I'm a big fan. Um, but, you know, the uh, that that's one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, you need to it's a, a you need to go into the relationship having, you know, shown that you've done some research and then they'll be more open to listening to your music if you're interfacing with a, a music supervisor directly. So I would I would be very cautious how I approach them because I've heard that over and over again from so many music supervisors over the years. Uh, some that are very open to, to just random submissions, some that aren't, but they all say, if you just throw random stuff at me and don't take the time to understand what I'm working on, 
I'm probably not going to listen to your music. So I think that that's real good advice, and it echoes a lot of, of what we're seeing as well. I think it's a combination of a uh, couple of strategies, and just to maybe summarize what, what you just said. You know, you want to go broad in that you've got your music in multiple places where it can be found, and it you have good descriptions of what what the music sounds like so that when supervisors are looking for certain things and they happen to be using one directory or another or one search tool or another that you're there so yeah. first of all you want to be broad so that you could be found and that you've des described your music well yeah. Second is that you want to go uh, laser targeting in that you're, you're doing your research and you're figuring out who's responsible, what they're looking for, the type of music uh, that they've placed already, what that project is about, and network your way in there as much as you can. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree 100% that, that first off with your music, describing it, um, you know, it, even just here at cdbaby.com, there's several fields where you can add style descriptions or album descriptions and when you're leaving that blank or just putting some random thing in there that's a missed opportunity because those become keywords that people can search by and so uh, you know the a lot of the uh, music that I was licensing for CD Baby some of it was just because they got on CDBaby.com and were searching uh, for tracks or they were searching on iTunes and searching by themes searching by all sorts of things and if, if you're not putting that information out there and describing your music, uh, it's easy for, uh, you know, you could have the perfect track. It could be exactly what they're looking for, and they may not find it. But then, yes, going deeper and, and starting to try and network. Um, I saw someone in the, the, the comments, the chat room, say that music supervisors won't return your emails. That, that, that may feel true. And it, I certainly when when I was pitching tracks for CD Baby, I felt I felt that that's uh, what was going on. And the, you know, they're getting lots of emails, lots of pitches. But you would be surprised how many times uh, they open up their email. They're really looking for a track, and if you address them appropriately um, and and uh, make it easy for them to get to your music and describe it in a quick little blurb. Uh, how many times they might actually listen. So it is, it is a, a, an approach where you have to kind of have a long game in mind. If, if, you're, if you're wanting to get placements and you email, you get a contact list of music supervisors and you spend a week emailing them and nothing, nothing happens and then you give up, then it, that, that's not the right approach to, to breaking into this, this, this world. It's, it's making connections. Um, meeting people because one thing that's really important uh, you know Dave you mentioned the advantage for independent artists is that we own both rights of the music we own the song and we own the master recording in most cases if we're writing original music uh, licensing a track where I own all that is so easy that music supervisors love working with independent artists who display a level of professionalism that they know they're going to be easy to work with because they don't have to go track down all these rights owners. It's like, hey, I can just come to you. I can clear the song. Um, you get paid. I get the song I want. The, the, the production gets what they want. Everybody's happy. Um, so that, that's one advantage that's, that independent artists have. So the music supervisor community does like working with independent artists because if you can, since you're representing both sides of the rights, it becomes an easy transaction for them. So uh, we're going we're gonna to jump ahead in a, in a minute uh, and, and talk about kind of the microsync world and what's happening on YouTube. Um, I'd just like to point out that, you know, the, the stats that I've heard is roughly about 3% of the money in the music business is, is being generated by syncs in film and TV. So it's important to keep in mind that, you know, this is not the, the magic bullet that is, is going to necessarily save everyone's career. Uh, that's kind of the bad news, the sobering news. The good news there is there are more and more films being produced. Uh, you know, a few years ago it was 2,500 a year, and, and these days it's seven or 8,000 a year. Uh, 
you know, of, of films that are trying to make it into the market. And when you start looking at what's happening on YouTube, those numbers really skyrocket. So it's not just, uh, you know, the traditional sync route uh, as the only route available to you. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go to that now, and let's talk about uh, microsyncs uh, for a second. Hang on, folks. Okay, so we're going to define uh, microsync as, you know, a small sync deal uh, that usually is lower fees but much more frequent. So you're looking at what's happening in YouTube and, and uh, what's happening with independent uh, productions on YouTube and the opportunity uh, for us to create music for this medium. Uh, there are over th 300 hours of video uploaded every single minute to YouTube. Uh, a billion users, four billion video views every day. And there's an absolutely thriving community of amateur and professional content creators on YouTube. It represents, you know, a brand new ecosystem, a brand new opportunity for music. When you think about the, uh, the number of hours of music being uploaded every minute, or number of hours of video being uploaded every minute, you do the math and you start thinking about the hours of music potentially that can be licensed or that you can place uh, your music into. It's, it's a staggering number. So getting paid is the key and there have been a lot of questions about this. YouTube has created this system called Content ID where if you are in their database, if you have music that you've created in their database, uh, when someone else uses those songs, they will search that database and get back to you and give you some choices as to what you can do about it. And of course, you know, this started with the, the labels wanting to take down videos that contained, you know, licensed, unlicensed music, uh, but it soon became a phenomenon where now you have choice. You can leave it up and see what happens, or better still, you can monetize it directly. So if somebody is using your music, you have the opportunity to monetize it instead of blocking it and taking it down. <clears throat> so the benefits of licensing on YouTube is you have this exploding phenomenon of videos being uploaded and shared and traded. You have more exposure than ever before. Uh, using the content ID system and the licensing system that Kevin's going to talk more about, you have the potential uh, to allow the use and get recurring revenue for yourself. And even though it's little amounts, you know, little amounts every single day over a period of time really add up. And to me, the most exciting part of the whole thing is the new economy that is really being created. You know, YouTube is, is not that old. And you know, prior to it, you had uh, film and TV and commercials. Now you have YouTube as a phenomenal platform uh, for licensing music in a variety of ways. And I know Kevin's got a lot to share about what's going on with, uh, with YouTube and CD Baby. Yeah, YouTube has become a, an amazing platform for sharing content. Um, uh, real quick, though, before I jump into that, I just remembered one thing. I saw someone ask about, you know, describing your music. I've learned uh, a really good trick. If your music's on Pandora, just create a playlist with uh, your music and see what bands it recommends, and those are some good sounds-like options for you to pitch to music supervisors when you're actually... Uh, you know, approaching them with like, hey, we sound like this band. Just did, wanted to throw that out there before I forgot. But uh, with YouTube, yeah, I mean, there there are so many uh, people uploading videos and uh, using music on that platform. It's crazy. I mean, it's just exploded. It's still growing. I believe I saw a report that uh, they they grew sixty percent. Uh, in, in as far as viewership and people watching videos this past year. And uh, it, it's just 
uh, a totally different animal than when we're talking about traditional sync. Um, with, with YouTube, uh, you have to look at things a little differently. The, the, what, what's happening in the world of micro-sync with people using your, your music in, in uh, video creation tools. There's some like Animoto, there's YouTube, and uh, uh, a bunch of others where users are creating content. And these are, you know, would be considered uh, consumer-grade users. These aren't the pros in LA making a feature-length film. These are people that are just making all sorts of stuff at a consumer level and want to upload it online and they want to add music to it and there's all these tools out there that will let them do that. Um, and it changes the, the equation. Yes, you're getting paid far less, but if you start seeing traction and, and, and start enabling people like your fans to use your music on the platform, it can really start adding up to a lot of money. Um, uh, we've had artists making uh, that, have, that have surpassed the 100,000 mark just from their music on YouTube, um, it's it's crazy. Um, but uh, you know, one one artist I'd point out uh, named Josh Collum. I interviewed him on the podcast I do for CD Baby. You can go check out that podcast. We really talked about the whole micro sync thing. But his story is really cool because he was in a band and just making music like everybody typically approaches it, uh, releasing, uh, touring, and. Uh, he had some music on YouTube, and he was seeing some checks, you know, like every quarter is when YouTube uh, money normally comes out. He was getting, you know, like 250 bucks, 500 bucks, you know, just just pretty consistently. Then suddenly it started to spike, and that went to, you know, a couple hundred bucks to a couple thousand bucks to 10,000 bucks every quarter. And just like, he's like, whoa, what is going on here? And it, for him, what was really fascinating is uh, two things in particular that really highlight how this platform is totally different. Uh, one, uh, he had a song called Happy, and he found that people were searching and finding his song and adding it to their wedding videos. And you're thinking, wedding videos? Are you just talking about like, you know, someone set a web, you know, a vid a video camera at the back of the room and film the wedding and post on YouTube. No, the world has changed where people are making these very elaborate, professionally done wedding videos and they want music to them. And for some reason, that song, Happy, is a very poppy song, uh, you know, acoustic kind of, uh, I'm trying to think who it would be similar to, but, you know, very poppy, accessible song. That all these wedding videos were getting added to and just, it, and he started getting all these fans from, these wedding videos, he started getting asked to play at weddings, and it was just this whole weird tap into this niche market that because people were searching for his song and finding, or searching and finding his song, and uh, you know, I asked him, I, I figured in his case it could be very possible that the song being named Happy, that people were probably going online searching for, I want a happy song, you know, I'm getting married, what's a happy song? And because his song was titled Happy, it was popping up and they were throwing them in his, their, their wedding videos and it started adding up to a lot of money. The other thing that was fascinating uh, was that he started randomly getting a lot of uh, people that were fans of the, uh, what is the Mockingjay, the, 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 that's one of the movies, but... Uh, from the Hunger Games? From the Hunger Games. I believe it was the Hunger Games. If it wasn't the Hunger Games, it was the one with the vampires. <laughs> I'm terrible with movie names, but the, but somebody posted a a video on YouTube that had the track listing for the soundtrack to uh, to the movie, and it was uh, originally they used one of the songs from the soundtrack, and and they got a copyright claim, and so they removed that song and they put one of Josh's songs in, and this video, all of this video was was literally it just rolled the track listing of the artists that were on the, the soundtrack for that movie and that video had millions of views but they had to replace it because they couldn't use any of those songs so they put Josh's song in there huh. and he was getting all these fans from that track and people buying his music and it was just such a random unexpected usage and you're like who, who on earth is going to post a video of, of a track listing for a movie soundtrack and then why is it getting millions of views? And that's that's kind of the the quirks of this platform that when you kind of understand how this is different, this world is different, that and you can start 
you know, taking advantage of some of those opportunities that it can really start to add up to a lot of money for you. So there's, it, I think it highlights how people want to use music differently than we expect as artists. And I think the major label system has gotten really scared and like, we don't want you using our music. We want to control it. We want to clamp it down. We don't want anyone doing anything that we don't have complete control over. Whereas an independent artist, you know, I want to empower my fans and people out there to use my music in ways that just yeah. drives revenue and also builds fans at the same time from niche groups that I never would have expected, whether it be wedding videographers and people who are attending weddings and the wedding crowd or uh, you know, fans of a major blockbuster movie that my music kind of fits in with the people that are on that soundtrack. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating example of how that platform can drive opportunity and revenue for artists in a different way. And it was driving so much revenue for Josh that he actually sort of reoriented his whole career around making music for that. He actually ended up starting his own licensing company that, that is geared at making original music for, for advertising agencies. And, and such, and that opportunity kind of led him into that, and and uh, it, it's it's just a really cool story, and you know it's it's something that's that can happen to a lot of independent artists. It's not like his story is so unique that it's like oh that was a once in a lifetime opportunity. No, it's it's an opportunity that's happening every day for independent artists. Lots of questions uh, related to you know how did people get the tracks or how do you get your your music to the point where people can can use it. And I think the phenomenon that we want to look at here is, you know, user generated content is what YouTube is all about. And yep. people are just doing crazy things, you know, as part of their life or or for fun or for a professional purpose. And they're putting them up there. And they need music in order to deliver the emotion in many mm -hmm. cases of, of what it is that they're trying to convey. So if it's a wedding video or it's a stupid cat video or whatever, that's an opportunity for them to take a song, some song that they're aware of, and put it in that video and put it on YouTube. And that that is, uh, you know, if you have your music out there one way or another, and you have it online, you have it on iTunes and CD Babies distributing all over the place, and you know, you've got your music out there. If people become aware of it and they use it, you now have a sync opportunity. And actually, you didn't really seek it out, right? Yeah, you right. connected with somebody and they found it. And that's the phenomenon that's so interesting. Yeah, and I have to say, one of the weirdest places I found one of my songs being used, uh, I randomly got a sale at CD Baby uh, for a really old album from, like, an album back in 2004. The band was long gone. It's not linked anywhere, not being promoted anywhere. I, st I started seeing some random sales. I'm like, what's this all about? And I followed the web hits in my account to a forum that was all about people that do power washing for a profession. <laughs> and some guy who was a power washer put one of my songs in his YouTube video to demonstrate you know, the work he does. And it was all these people in this forum were asking what the song was. And uh, he ended up buying some music because of it. And it's like, oh my gosh, people are using music in ways and, and to show things online that I never would have thought of. And it and it's it whether it's your fans making really cool videos that you can you know even tap them to you know empower your fans to potentially even make an official music video for you. Unleash all your fans, have them go make videos. You're just seeding the internet with more of your content. Or if it's just random everyday folks that just need a. a some emotional music to put behind whatever they're they're posting online. There's so much content being created by people that that it's a it's a great opportunity for independent artists to just empower anybody who wants uh, to do it. Somebody asked the question about how how uh, you uh, get paid for this YouTube activity, and that's that's where if you're a member of CD Baby, it's and you're using us to distribute your music. The YouTube monetization is a free add-on service. Um, we don't do it unless you tell us to do it. So if you're using us to distribute your music, make sure you've opted into that. And then we send your music to YouTube in a fingerprint form that they use to go out all over YouTube and make sure that any video using your track is is monetized on your behalf. So if uh, if you're not signed up for a, a YouTube monetization program, uh, that you you won't be collecting money from that. So be sure you're signed up for for that program. 
All right. So, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about traditional sync licensing for film and TV uh, and how you might approach music producers and how you want to have your songs available in a lot of different databases and a lot of different formats for supervisors to find. And we talked about how you network your way uh, and research your way into productions that are going on. That's uh, the traditional world. Uh, and again, about 3% of the music revenue right now is being generated by those sinks. We've talked a little bit about uh, what's happening on YouTube. And it's a new phenomenon that is not, you know, it's not really being uh, controlled. And it's probably still the Wild West uh, out there and how it's mm -hmm. taking shape. And you know, it's, it's important that you have your music out there so that people can find it and that you have the ability through CD Baby or uh, whatever mechanism works best for you, but that their platform is, is really, really great and so simple to use that if somebody does use your music or you're able to find somebody that's got something happening on YouTube and connect them, uh, connect with them and get them to use your music, that's a whole new revenue stream. And I think, you know, we will, we will see, my prediction is that we will see the sync licensing from YouTube uh, take over the traditional sync licensing from film and TV in the, in the near future. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely growing like crazy. I mean, it, the, the thing is, you know, there's, you know, I've heard someone say there's only about 10,000 music supervisors, you know, I don't know if they were saying in the country or in the world that are actually working on productions, but there's, you know, a billion people uploading videos every day. Uh, and there's, there's people that are, you know, that they, they can harness, uh, you can harness their activity to the benefit of your music, and they want to use your music. And so there's so much more opportunity. I think that uh, the, the, the usage of music beyond YouTube and just in other microsync opportunities with um, apps uh, and, and such, even Facebook. Facebook is, is in the process of negotiating uh, music rights for the video usage on that platform. So that there's, there's a lot of, of places where your music uh, can get used and synced with video in a what would be a non-traditional sense that's just going to keep driving more and more revenue to you as an artist. And you mentioned, uh, David, still being the Wild West. That is true. And I saw someone in the chat room mention, well, don't they need a sync licensing for uh, sync placement license for using a, a song in a video on YouTube? Um, technically, yes. And uh, there are people that have tried to solve that problem and are working to solve that problem and making it still an easy, simple transaction for consumers that encourages them to use music at the level that they're really, you know, using the music as opposed to, you know, I want to upload my wedding video. It, I'm, no one's going to use your song if they have to pay $1,000 for it. But, you know, I still think we, we, we are in the Wild West and we're working, the, you know, it's, we're working towards something that I think is going to be uh, a future state that will be even more beneficial to the artist. I agree. Uh, we've got a lot of questions flowing in. We've answered some. We're going to get to a few more. But before we do that, um, I want to just ask Kevin, uh, what's go what What's new that's going on at CD Baby? Anything that you want to tell us about that uh, you think folks would be interested in while we've got them here? Yeah, uh, one thing we're working on related to making money from YouTube is we've uh, just recently launched our own multi-channel network, and that's where uh, you know you bring uh, channels together uh, in a in under a, a more of like a parent company type relationship in a way that benefits all the channels and, and opens up more opportunities for the uh, individual YouTube channels. Um, that, that brand is called Il the Illustrated Sound Network. That's the Illustrated Sound Network. Um, we're, we're still in our beta phase. We're about to exit our beta phase and it's just going to be a really great opportunity for people that are driving uh, views and subscribers and traffic on their actual YouTube uh, channel. This is different than people using your music in their videos. This is, you know, you have a YouTube channel and you're using it as a real media outlet. Um, so it, you can go to illustratedsound 
dot com, and if you've got a, a YouTube channel that meets the the criteria, you can you can join our network, and it it opens up some pay, uh, some more payment opportunities, some more ads opportunities to be shown on your videos, um, some networking opportunity, and when we uh, yeah, there's the website uh, when. When we exit beta, which is supposed to happen next month, there's going to be an amazing dashboard that will allow you to track so many different things, and it'll allow you to push video to both YouTube and Facebook and track the performance on both those platforms and uh, and monetize in in some really cool ways. So that's that's one of the ways we're we're uh, one of the new things we're working on uh, related to you know this whole world of YouTube and sync licensing. We're also expanding our sync database and using some tools to really enhance the data that we have on our catalog and pitching more and more uh, placements. Um, I didn't mention at the top, but you know some recent placements we've gotten, uh, you know a primetime TV show that paid forty five thousand dollars, a bunch of you know uh, placements with um, various brands that were you know in like the ten thousand dollar range. Um, plenty of placements that are, you know, like a thousand dollars, two thousand um, dollars. It just depends, like you, like you mentioned at the top, those things are, are all over the, all over the map as far as what you get paid. But we're trying to really increase the amount of placements we're getting in that area and using some tools and technology to enhance the catalog so music's easier for people to find and, and get placed. So those are some of the things we're working on in that that area that I'm really excited about and and uh, looking forward to the coming year to roll in. Uh, exiting beta on Illustrated Sound and really ramping up what we're doing uh, with Sync to a whole new level. So uh, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, we'll get to some questions here in just a second. I just want to summarize. You know, you can approach licensing your music for film, TV, and YouTube on a very proactive way. Uh, we've talked about getting into different catalogs and being available, having your music described uh, adequately so that it can be found, making it easy to find your music. That, that puts you in the, you know, potentially in the running. If no one knows about you, then you, you don't have a shot. So you want to be in these catalogs. You want to do your research uh, to find productions that are going on and, and how you might fit in. Uh, the world of music, as, as you all know, is really a very relationship-driven business. It's being in the right place at the right time, being able to solve a problem for somebody. Uh, no one wants to work harder than they have to, so the more you can be out there, the more you can be networking, the easier it is to find your music, the more likely it is that you'll, you'll get a placement or, or you'll at least get a look. Uh, Kevin also talked about... Uh, YouTube is really kind of two, the two approaches. One is having other people use your songs in their videos, whatever they may be, whether they're professional or they're just for fun or it's a, you know, a class video or a wedding video or just something really stupid that goes viral. You know, if somebody uses your song and you start getting millions of views and they start running lots of ads against that, you can make some some good money. So that is, again, having your music out there, uh, being able to uh, have people be able to just take your tracks and use them. Uh, they're not asking your, for your permission, but if you're in the YouTube database, if you're in the uh, Content ID database and someone uses your song, uh, you will get paid and you will uh, be able to monetize that use. And that's another way to go. Third way is creating proactive videos on your channels that use your music and monetizing those channels directly or through a network as, as Kevin's talked about. So those are three strategies that we have uh, as far as ex exploring syncs and licensing your music. So let's get to some questions here. Uh, Kevin, there's a bunch about kind of rates. Uh, What's the average charge for a song? Uh, do you get paid once? Uh, what happens if it goes uh, outside of the first use onto DVD or Netflix or something like that? How would you answer that? Uh, well, usually with uh, with independent artists and uh, you know, music supervisors like to structure a deal this way. 
now in the digital age anyway, but typically a, a, a contract would be uh, you're granting them for all types of usage, all media is what it'll say, in perpetuity. Uh, those, those are the words that you'll typically see in a contract, all media in perpetuity, meaning if I get a song placed in, say, a movie, and it's in the movie theaters, they're not going to pay me again when they put it on Netflix. Um, that being said, you can, in certain circumstances, earn performance royalties from the usage of your song in that movie. Uh, a commercial is a, a TV show and a commercial, those are perfect examples of when you know I got placed in a TV show, they gave an upfront sync fee, uh, and you know for a non-featured placement, meaning there's not this big focus on the song in a TV show, uh, you know you're going to get a couple thousand bucks for that, and um, but then when that TV shows, you're going to earn performance royalties. Anytime that TV show airs, it'll generate money. Uh, a lot of the MTV shows. Uh, that uh, you know, reality shows that they had, they used a ton of music. A lot of times with MTV, they weren't paying anything up front for the usage of that music, but MTV played those shows so often that artists were earning, on average, I heard from people about $4,000 from performance royalties because they played those shows over and over and over again to you know, a national and sometimes a worldwide audience. So it just depends. That different shows have different budgets, and that's where, as an independent artist, it's good to understand the show that you're approaching. Um, if you're approaching a primetime TV show that's a big hit, they're going to have a budget. If, if you're approaching, but, it's, but what's weird is that sometimes some of those primetime TV shows have a really small budget. It's just random and you kind of have to get to know the people, ask the right questions and uh, if you go in there and they offer you something and you counter offer you know 10 times more they're just gonna move on so you you, you gotta be realistic and understand that uh, people have budgets just because they work for NBC doesn't mean they have an unlimited amount of money that they can throw at each individual song um, but they usually uh, will come in at, at, at a certain area and there's can be some negotiating room um, as an independent artist it, it helps if you've been placed before uh, one time I had an artist that, that uh, was placed by NBC, they came back and wanted to use another song by that artist, and because they'd used that artist before, they bumped them up, uh, basically doubled the fee the next time around. But that was just what they did in that particular case. It's different every time. We've seen a lot of independent artists here get, um, you know, fifty thousand dollars, eighty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars for a major placement. You know, I've talked to, was working with an artist once. We didn't get him the placement, but he got a placement in a commercial that got used in the Super Bowl. And uh, he got a big payday and lots of performance royalties. So it, it just depends. But those are some ranges, you know, that, that are out there. Um, but you just got to understand who you're working with. If it's an independent film, they might ask you to use it for free because they don't have any music budget. So, uh, you know, you got to weigh the opportunity with what the, the placement is. Um, some people might turn down an independent film that, that uh, doesn't pay and say there's, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to go that route. Other people say, well, you never know. I might pick up some fans because of it. So, Yeah. Well, as I said earlier, you know, if you're, if you're being asked to license your music for free, you need to decide whether the exposure is going to be worth it for you or not. And keep in your hip pocket this notion of a step deal in that, you know, you can let them use it for free, but if the project gross is, you know, X amount of money, you get, Y, or the project grosses 10x, you get 10y, or even more. So you can negotiate these step rates uh, in your deals. Yeah. Uh, I want to maybe ask you if you would kind of uh, clarify the roles. We get a lot of questions like this here. Do people need their own publishing company in order to do this? And what's the relationship between the PRO and the publishing company? In, in these various scenarios that we've talked about? Well, the, the PRO will just, you know, collect the royalties that are generated from the performance of your, your song, you know, your composition when it get, gets used. And with uh, sync licensing, there's some quirkiness to it of when they collect and when they don't. In the U.S., it's weird. Uh, in the theaters, when, you're, when your song's played in a movie theater, movie theaters don't pay performance royalties. But if it's on TV, they do collect performance royalties. 
the publisher is is you know if you're an independent artist and you own your music and you haven't assigned your rights to the song to anyone else you're also the publisher so there is some publishing money that can be generated from the the usage of the music but um, but yeah so the performance royalties are going to come they usually they typically refer to them as back end royalties they're going to happen when something happens you know like it's played perform uh, publicly where the publishing money and what they pay for the composition and you know the, the master recording that's going to be upfront money that they pay and uh, you know typically it'll be something you might hear them refer to a, uh, a, a deal like we'll pay you a thousand dollars per side and what they're referring to is we'll pay you a thousand dollars to clear the publishing we'll pay you a thousand dollars to uh, pay to cover for the master recording and if you own both of those that just means they're going to pay you two thousand dollars. So, um, but you know, you you could do a cover song that gets licensed as well, and in that case, they would only pay you to use the master recording because you don't own the rights to the song. So, those are some situations that can come up. Cool. All right, I don't, I don't want to wear you out too much. Uh, talk a little bit about the. Uh, you know the notion of a of a multi-channel network on on YouTube. What is that, and does that affect the royalties that you would get versus kind of just going it alone on your own channel? Yeah, the benefit of being in a network, uh, you kind of have to think about it like um, cable television. I think is a good way to think about what these networks are doing on YouTube. So if you like, you know, ESPN or HGTV or the Learning Channel, History Channel, there are a bunch of different shows that are made by different production companies, different people that all live on that channel as sort of a network. And what the benefit of it is is that people that are spending money to run ads, that's what's generating the revenue for you on YouTube, can look at those demographics and go, yes, I want to reach people that like music or I want to reach this demographic and they can look at a network and select that as a demographic that they target. When you're kind of a, a free-range channel out there on YouTube, you can still monetize your channel, but uh, the, the advertising opportunities that happen on your channel aren't as lucrative as when you're a part of a network. And so I, I think the easiest way that people would be familiar with is like, you know, how advertisers go after the, the people that watch HGTV is different than the advertising you see on ESPN and that's how uh, as YouTube has evolved how these networks are operating when it comes to um, the advertising and the, how money is spent and uh, so and also for us it's the opportunity for us to partner with other brands and and companies to to do some collaborative uh, things around the network and um, and even between some of the artists that are in the network so that that's how you know a network is different than just being a, a, a free range channel out there on YouTube. Great, thanks. Uh, one other kind of bundle of questions around: Do you need a? Do you need to have your own publishing company in order to to do these types of deals? Uh, or should you be signing with another publishing company? So indie, create your own versus sign with another. Uh, and kind of the role of a lawyer in crafting some of these agreements. Uh, what is your take on that? With the caveat that you're not a lawyer. <laughs> I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I am definitely not a lawyer. Uh, basically, you know, speaking to the lawyer uh, piece, um, you know, as an artist, if you start having these opportunities, I would probably seek out, you know, a lawyer that that is friendly to the independent artist, meaning they're not going to charge you every time you want to take them to coffee or something. Somebody that's going to want to see you kind of as, uh, you know, not only someone that's uh, a client, but maybe that they can mentor as well and, and and throw some free legal advice your way. There's lots of our uh, lawyers out there that are happy to just, you know, help a, an independent artist with like a, an easy question about a sync licensing uh, contract. Um, a lot of the sync contracts are really simple. They're straightforward. Um, so, 
it, unless you're getting into something that's a little bit bigger, you know, film, there's there there might be some various things happening in a film contract with a sync licensing deal that you may want someone to look at and explain to you. But uh, you know, it, it doesn't hurt. I know the one thing though why I'm saying it would be good to have a relationship built in ready to go is with a lawyer if you feel like you're going to need one is because like if you're talking about a TV sync placement they could literally email you or call you on Wednesday night wanting to use your song for a TV show that's going to air Friday evening and if you're not able to sign off on it within you know a couple hours or definitely within 24 hours they're not going to use your song. TV moves really quick and so you want to make sure that you're not going, wait a minute, I gotta go find a lawyer to look at this. They'll be like, never mind, we're gonna move on to somewhere else. But it, it's always good to get to know a few people that you can get some advice on when things get a bit hairy. As far as the publishing aspect, uh, the you don't need a publishing company set up in order to, to, to do this. Um, the one thing that is important is that some of the ways sync uh, songs get used not only in sync licensing just in the digital world in general these days also generates publishing money that uh, without a publishing administrator you're not going to be able to collect um, and that's what our CD Baby Pro product is we become your publishing administrator you keep all the rights to your music you just enable us to go collect as a publisher on your behalf and uh, uh, there's a lot of things like every time your music streamed on just like Spotify or Apple Music, it's actually generating publishing money that if you don't have a publishing administrator set up, you're not going to be able to collect that. And there's some situations where in sync licensing you might miss out on some publishing money if you don't have a publishing administrator set up. So it's that's a service we're offering to artists in order to make sure that they're capturing all that publishing money without giving all their music rights away or dealing with a publishing company that in reality is not not going to bat for their music. Okay, so uh, I understand you have some sort of a discount running for CD Baby for the next couple days. You want to tell everybody about that? And, and everybody who's still on this uh, webinar, thanks very much for hanging out. We've got a couple of special treats for you now. Yeah, right now if uh, you use, um, I'm trying to type into the, the uh, chat and talk at the same time. Uh, you can get a 20% discount on your album submission if you uh, use the coupon code that I'm putting in the chat feed. Um, and uh, that's that'll get you 20% off your an album submission. Um, when you distribute through CD Baby, you get all sorts of um, cool options like the YouTube monetization is a free add-on. We don't charge you extra for that. Your music will be around the world at all the, the music platforms that matter from Apple Music to Amazon to, to Google to Deezer to Spotify to streaming services and companies around the world that we haven't heard of in America because they are other places and we don't use them. We get your music to those places so you really have a global audience. And uh, we also sell music uh, from our website at cdbaby.com and uh, when you, people buy your music there, you make more money off your music than you would from any other retailer. So, uh, great tools like a music player that uh, is really cool, uh, that makes it easy for you to put your old catalog on your your website, and lots of other good things in the works. So, yeah, take advantage of that and and get your music out there. And you know, if you have any questions, my my Twitter handle is on the on the screen. You can follow me on Twitter. I always have Twitter open at work and. I'm always happy to answer people's questions or just listen to them, uh, uh, you know, see what's going on to their, with their career and all that. So, Fantastic. And for folks who are still on the uh, workshop here, uh, courtesy of CD Baby, we're offering a $200 discount on the new artist model. If you use the discount code CD Baby when you check out, uh, you can get $200 off uh, our complete program. This offer expires on Monday, so if you're interested, you don't want to uh, you don't want to wait. As I said earlier, uh, we have a complete online music business program that is a self-paced program that will uh, take you through all aspects of the music business, uh, including 
these main areas, you can see that we cover uh, the gamut of touring, recording, production, distribution, how to build a great team, your copyrights, your licensing, your publishing, marketing and promotion, budgeting and crowdfunding. It's a very, very extensive program. In particular, because you're here for copyright and publishing, a lot of the questions you guys are asking are answered in the course. Uh, we have two main units on copyright, publishing, and licensing, and you can see the different areas that are covered right here. And if you're interested, uh, this offer is, is running through uh, Monday. We also have thousands of bonus resources that you get when you sign up for the program in all of these categories. So if you're interested in marketing or promoting, uh, distributing, touring, where to get your merch manufactured, the different options for crowdfunding, what conferences you might want to go to, sample contracts uh, for many of the things that we're talking about tonight, thousands of resources, and the discount code is CDBABY. Uh, use it when you check out. You go to newartistmodel.com slash CDBABY. Go right through. The, this offer is good until Monday, so I hope you can take advantage of it. And I want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming in and uh, spending some time. You have a lot of good questions. I hope we've answered some of them. Uh, Kevin, thank you very much for your time. And uh, you, you got a conference coming up uh, in October, right? You still have a few tickets left? Yeah, we are doing our first ever DIY Musician Conference in Chicago, October 23rd through 25th. And, uh, yeah, there's only about uh, 30 or so tickets left uh, when I looked right before jumping on this, this webinar. So it's going to be a great event. I'm super excited. Uh, and, uh, yeah, everyone should check it out if you're in the Chicago area especially. Um, but the, the website is DIYMusicianCon.com. That's DIYMusicianCon.com. And, uh, yeah, you'll find out all the details. And it'll be a good time. Looking forward to hanging out with all the artists. Well, fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. Got an exclusive discount, courtesy of CD Baby on New Artist Model. Go to newartistmodel.com slash CD Baby. Use the coupon code CD Baby when you check out and get $200 off the program. Courtesy of CD Baby. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everyone, for coming in. Have a terrific evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Take care.